Oh, somebody else got it quickly. Okay. So God bless. Um, good evening. Before we pray, I want to just um, tell you an encouraging story. So I was doing um, a, a group session two weeks ago, and um, we were talking about emotions and, you know, feelings and how they can hinder you um, progressing. And um, it kind of dropped in my spirit how um, I used to suffer with depression really bad. And um, it was so that um, I was familiar with that way of living. And um, it was because um, I was born that way, actually. So I had some, um, I, I would say, dark tendencies that I didn't know were abnormal until later in my life. <clears throat> and um, I'm sure that my mom didn't, you know, um, she just called me mean or evil or whatever. And um, so anyway, as I got older, um, I started recognizing that people were happy, but I didn't have, you know, that happiness, meaning like it, people would laugh and they would enjoy themselves, but I would get up and it, it would be so hard for me to get up in the mornings. Um, so then I found myself in a spirit of laziness and depression. And, of course, I didn't know that I was depressed because I had always live like this. Um, I had, I would say, when I realized what was going on, 29 days of darkness and maybe two or three days of light. And um, so while I was talking to the group about this, I began to tell them that people make excuses for themselves not to get up and go to work or not to do what they need to do for themselves. But I didn't have that advantage because um, my family, I won't say that they weren't, they were discouragers, but they weren't encouragers. So even with um, depression and, and I didn't know what it was, just, you know, someone would say you're just mean or you're unhappy, you're just this and you're just that. I, I realized when I got older that it was depression. So no one was there to um, encourage me. And um, as I was talking to them, it dawned on me my purpose. One of my purpose was to encourage people. So how would I encourage people if I didn't know how to encourage my own self, you see? And um, so I went on talking to them, and I was letting them know that um, I, I couldn't make any money Um, I would have to be a prostitute if I stayed in the bed because um, I was so acquainted with depression. It was hard for me to get up until I started realizing that I had to motivate myself. So to um, my group, I told them, I said, many people, they'll lay in the bed until 12 o'clock in the daytime. And I did that as a teenager as well. But I found myself having to make a way. I had to you know, convince myself every day to get up out of the bed early um, to find a way to secure a job because I couldn't make money laying in the bed. And they found it to be amusing, and I'm glad that they did because it brought them in. I said I, I, I could never make money because I'm not a prostitute. That's not my way of living. You know what I'm saying? Some people can lay in the bed and they don't see that there's more and that you have to make yourself do something because your flesh is overriding the truth of who you are. And so until you realize that you have to do it because no one else is going to do it, you will be there and life will pass you by. And so I hope someone got something out of this story because people are waiting on people. And if you're waiting on people, it will never happen. Whatever you're waiting for, you'll be waiting for the rest of your life. So the wake up is now. And comply has a lot to do with whatever works you came to do. 
conclude, so I'm going to pray, and we'll go right into Nehemiah 4. And so, Father God, we just thank you for this day, and we thank you for your healing, and we thank you for the blood of Jesus that brings divine order, um, and it brings uh, truth. It brings enlightenment for your people. It brings deliverance. Your word in the Bible, it says in 53 of Isaiah, by the blood of Jesus, that we would all be healed by your 40 stripes, that we would be healed in our mind, bodies, and our souls, and our spirits collectively, communicably, and um, in the, the world totally. We even thank you that there is healing in families, marriages, um, that children are being um, set free from any kind of holdups that the enemy has had them, that you're uniting families today in the name of Jesus. And, Father God, you're blessing people in their careers. You're blessing them in their um, uh, relationships. You're blessing them in their families, oh, God. And you're, you're bringing together families where they've been scattered throughout centuries and ages for our people in the name of Jesus. You're bringing unity like never before as the anointing flowed down and the oil down Aaron's beard. You're bringing forth unity and healing for families in the name of Jesus. We declare and we decree um, healing there financially, mentally, physically, and spiritually that no weapon formed against your people shall prosper. Thank you that they're coming forth and the blinders are, are falling off and they're realizing what their purpose is, Lord God. So what you have sent us here for, you said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray that you will hear from heaven. And so now we ask you to hear the prayers of the righteous in the name of Jesus and release your blessing upon this group as you always did. We come together in praise and in victory tonight, thanking you, worshiping you, lifting you up, and we thank you for clarity in your word. We thank you, God, for your anointing. We thank you for your words of wisdom that comes through your word in the mighty name of Jesus. And so we just send forth healing and peace and joy. We thank you for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We thank you like a tree planted by the rivers of the water, we shall not be moved. We thank you that as the Holy Spirit comes in, Lord God, you begin to stir up gifts, stir up gifts and move like you never have before. Move in a mighty, mighty awesome way. Move throughout the week right now. Begin to move throughout the week in the name of Jesus and move any kind of mountains, any kind of stumbling blocks, oh God, in the name of Jesus and give your people understanding of what they're walking through so that they'll be encouraged to continue the good fight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. So... Amen. Excuse me. Enemies uphold the building or the rebuilding. So you think about this here, uh, chapter four, um, and I think it's imperative to encourage one another concerning. Um, what you're doing as this book says, hand me another brick, because in some ways you're building your own um, purpose, and um, and in some ways we're all incorporated building together. And so when we come on on Sundays, it's an encouragement. It's not that one person is encouraging, it's that we all find it necessary to encourage one another. The body of Christ is falling away because people are leaving it to individuals, and that's not how it's supposed to be. I was in um, 1 Corinthians as well, and Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 and 16, this is when you know yourself, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Um, whom you have received from God, and it's a question. You are not your own. Um, Second Corinthians says 7 and 16, um, I've chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. 
My eyes and heart will always be there. Signs and words that God lives within man will follow. What power we walk in, Jesus answered them in John 2:19. Um, he said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. So I'm going to go back to Nehemiah because what had happened is the wall had um, been broken down. And the wall had a symbolic meaning to um, the Jews. I mean, it's the wall that they're bowing at right now. So Sambalit was one that mocked the word of God, but Nehemiah <clears throat> had gotten a message in chapter one about the situation and um, he prayed about going back to assist with the wall. He didn't just go back to it because it was his home. He prayed before he took um, the route Um, and um, the king who he was serving gave him the ability to uh, go and assist with building the wall. Well, unbeknownst to him, when he got there, of course, there was no builders. The the, the wall was in ruins, and the wall was protection um, around um, that area that they were in in Jerusalem, okay? So here in 4 it says, um, Sambalit was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. And so whatever you're doing, if you're rebuilding something or if you're beginning something, um, if you feel like you're in the end of something, if you feel like um, you're not going to be able to make it, that's the um, catch here, that these people were doing something with the mind. So moving on, uh, he flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, um, saying in front of his friends, and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build a wall in a single day by just offering a a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? So in 3, verse 3, to buy the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked that stone wall would collapse if even a fox uh, walked along the top of it. But then Nehemiah began to pray. You see, this is the key. Wherever you're at in the situation, you have brothers and sisters that should hand you another brick because that's the way that you get the job done. It doesn't matter if you're working on something, if I'm working on something, we have to learn how to come together collectively and build one another. For some reason or another, I have had so much experience with people that if they, number one, want to stay behind the scenes, they don't want to take accountability for their purpose, that's one. Then there's another thing. They don't want to be a part of building, but they want to be a part of receiving, okay? It's not time for that. It's time to comply. So the word of the Lord before we started is very true. People put their hands together and they begin to work because two hands are better than one or four sets of hands is better than two. You understand? And the work gets done. So this is not about something that I need. You know, we just come and we begin to bind up unconsciousness. People that are walking around sleep, they don't understand why they're here. They believe that they can go here and there. They need to be motivated, but then I just gave a word about depression. You need something, but what about if God had not created anybody to do it for you? Would you get mad? Would you get angry? Or would you make a decision that you have to do it for yourself? You know, that's the bottom line because some of us are created in a place where we're chosen only to seek God. No one else is going to do it for us. However, as a leader, we are called to lead people, and that means that people follow. Why? Because there's the good news. It's the gospel according to Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, you have people that are coming in and out. They don't see the big picture, and that's cool because In most cases, they're not the ones that belong. But while they're here, 
And when they're here listening, if they don't adopt the branch of understanding that if the olive branch is handed to you, you have to hand it back. There's no complacency here. It's unity. Some people wonder why they're not getting a break. They wonder why something isn't happening here. They wonder why it's not happening there for them. They're frustrated. They're tired. But it's because they're missing, they're missing the big picture. Sometimes you're, you're supposed to be a part. And you're not putting your hand to the will that you need to be a part of. Hand me another brick. So if I ask you to hand me a brick and you don't have time, but then you ask me for a brick, why should I give you a brick? Do you understand? Life is a circle, reciprocated. It's a responsibility that we have to each other. Hand me a brick and we can build a house together. I will hand you the brick that you need, whatever you need, the purpose. If I can help you with it, I will. Now we begin to expect, right? And sometimes we can't because consciously people don't get it. We're sent here to unify collectively, unify in our family, unify in our communities, and then on a national level. But because We come in and out. We feel that we have no uh, roots in something. We never get all that we need to get because our roots are not planted, maybe possibly, in what we're supposed to do. It could be a purpose you're not rooted in. You're lost. You don't know. I've heard a lot of people say that this week. I'm sure as you find yourself getting back into prayer, fasting, you will find your purpose if you're really looking for it. Whatever you want from God, God will give it to you because God lives within you. So I'm going to go on back to to, uh, verse 4, and it says, Then I prayed, this is Nehemiah, Hear us, O God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads. And may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. This is a prayer. Do not blot out their sins, but they have provoked um, you to anger here in the front of, okay, of the, the builders. Now, this is us. We're the builders. They mocked you, God. Do not ignore their guilt. This is a prayer right out of the Bible. And At last, the wall was completed to have its height around the entire city, but the people had worked with enthusiasm. It wasn't one. It wasn't two. It was people that took a mind to do what God had called them to do. So I have um, um, a couple of... No, I'm, I'm not going to. Um, I sent this Stockdale Paradox, and I'm not sure who may have read it. It was a couple of weeks ago. Um, this was a admiral who was in the Navy. I, I can't remember when, but anyway, um, he was in captivity. He had been in a war, and he was in captivity. And so I'm going to go here because everything that looks like something is not always the way that it is. It's generally our perception. Um, Nehemiah was a leader that could see the way. But when you have leaders that can see the way and you have people that are working with you that do not follow directions, you're bound to have some problems. So perception is an issue. And oftentimes people don't understand that they don't follow because they don't trust. They're always looking for something else. I want to come over here and I want to go over here. I want to go to this place and that place. I need encouragement. I need this. I need that. But what about what other people need to get from you? Just hang your hang your hat right there. Because If your perception is not on point, then you'll miss the big picture. I'm lost. I don't know who I am. I don't know what to do. And 
the reason why you're lost, you're seeking everywhere, is because you have not taken upon yourself to really do what you're called to do. Here, your experience, it gets you ready. Your experiences in life, confidence <clears throat> that you have a purpose. That's what builds you, all right? And it gives you the solidification that you're qualified. The bad experiences, the painful times, they give you qualification that you can do this. You can do whatever. So you begin to think about, what are my experiences in? People think that when they go to college and when they, um, when they go to work, that's, your experience. that's not your experience. People need to be motivated, like I said. How many of those people that were supposed to have mental illness really got the big picture when I told them about how I had lived with depression? There was motivation there. No, I had to learn how to motivate myself. And so when I learned how to motivate myself, it made me understand as time went on who I was and some of the power that I walk in, the purpose. Why? Because no one motivated me but me and my God. You see, you have to really look at this. God said I created you to bless the people. Well, what is it with you that God gave you to bless the people. So oftentimes people will not look at and tell the story about the pains that they suffered. But I bet you I will. Because pain is the reason why people cannot gain. Pain is the, the reason why people cannot gain their victories. They stay in pain and, and, and rather than using the pain for gain. All right? Your pain is not meant to immobilize you. Your pain is made for you to use it to help others. So while we hold on to our pain, we're angry, we're bitter, what we're doing is losing life. Losing life. You have nothing without God. God is giving you the experiences, giving you the hardships, giving you the sorrows, giving you the woes, giving you the pain. God is responsible for all of that. People are looking and saying, but why? Because he said, I want you to make it a story. I want you to make it something that people are going to understand that they can overcome. Do you know how many people have been in your place? What you're suffering, what you're holding on to, do you know how many people? I do. Many. Joseph said that he had went through the pit experience so that many lives would be saved. How selfish it is for you to wait on somebody else to encourage you. How about you get up and you do that for somebody else? Stop letting uh, pride and, and shyness do, do you over in life. Stop letting it take God's glory. How selfish. How selfish. Okay, so here, Stockdale, he, he talks about um, his experience in, um, it was a camp where he was um, taking a prisoner of war. I want to get to, okay, what page am I on right now? <clears throat> Let me see. I'm going to just start here. It says, you can understand the in my anticipation at the prospect of spending part of an afternoon. This is the guy that is um, actually um, interviewing him. Um, he is actually an admiral in the Navy, but this was back maybe in the 20s, 30s, or 40s when this happened. But anyway, the story is pretty awesome. So it says, one of my students had written his paper on Stockdale, who happened to be a senior research fellow studying the Stoic philosophers at Hoover Institution right across the street from my office. And Stockdale invited the two of us for lunch in preparation I read In Love and War, 
The book Stockdale and his wife had written um, in alternating chapters chronicling their experiences during um, the eight years of his captivity and war. As I moved through the book, I found myself getting depressed. It just seemed so bleak the uncertainty of his fate, the brutality of his captors, and so forth. So he was beaten. All kind of stuff happened to this dude. And then it dawned on me, here I am sitting in my warm and comfortable office looking over or out over the beautiful um, Stanford campus um, on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, I'm getting depressed reading this, and I know the end of the story. I know that he gets out, reunites with his family, becomes a national hero, and gets to spend the later years of his life studying philosophy on this same beautiful campus. If it feels depressing for me, how on earth did he deal with it when he was actually there and did not know the end of the story? You see, you're the person that don't know the story, so what's happening is is that you have to create the story. Even with Nehemiah, he had to create a story. And so, so many storylines, they stay at the place of depression, hopelessness, um, I need somebody, I can't do it. You understand what I'm saying? However, it says, I never lost, this is him, I never lost faith in the end of the story, he said, when I asked him. Um, I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life, which I, in retrospect, I would not trade, okay? Um, I didn't say anything for many minutes. And we continued the slow walk towards the faculty club, Stockdale limping and arc swinging his uh, stiff leg, because this is what happened, one of the things that happened to him um, that had never fully recovered from re- repeated torture. Finally, after about 100 meters of silence, I asked, who didn't make it out? And so Stockdale says, oh, that's easy, he said, the optimist. The optimist, question mark. I don't understand. I said, now completely confused, given that he said 100 meters earlier. The optimists, oh, they were the ones who said we're going to be out by Christmas, and Christmas would come, and Christmas would go. Then they'd say we're going to be out by Easter, and Easter would come, and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving, and then it it would be uh, Christmas again, and they died of a broken heart. Another long pause and more walking. Then he turned to me and said, this is a very important lesson. This is what Stockdale is telling um, the reporter. It's Jim Collins. Um, He wrote, from good to great. Good is not enough. Greatness is what it has to be. All right. So another long pause and more walking. Then he turned to me and said, this is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, wherever they might be. To this day, I carry a mental picture. And so inevitably, what he was telling them is to see your expected end. Don't ever be so optimistic that you put a timeline on it. It taught me something because we do put time, and God is not in time. God is in spirit. And so how God is working it out is how it will be. You see, the Christian has to come to a place where he understands that it's, in, in most cases it's a test. And we get tired, but the Spirit has set and predestined us for things in life. Whenever you said yes to Christ, you maybe didn't know what you signed up for, but I bet we know now. And that means that in the reality of it, there is an expected end, but we have no timing on it. If you put timing on it, then that's what kills it. I can guarantee because I I felt that experience, you know. I felt the experience of desiring something to happen now, but it 
it happened for me three or four years later, but how weighty is it on your heart? And this is what he was saying to them, the optimist. So you got to keep yourself in a place where you expect to see it because that's how it's going to be. But you don't know the time and the day that it's coming. And that's just like Jesus. We do not know the day and time that Christ is coming. Amen? And so your expectation and your helping hands to build one another while you're waiting for your breakthrough is how you get to that day of overcoming. There's a victory, but it's how we pursue it. There's a victory. Victory also comes in assisting us because everything that happens in the world, in universe, has to do with us being collective and assisting one another. A lot of people don't understand that they're not getting what they want because they're not helping in the areas. They're not pursuing their purpose. They're being who they want to be. Where's your change at? This guy prayed, Nehemiah, before he went. It can always seem like the right thing to do, to go where you feel like you want to go. But you need to pray about where you are supposed to be, not where you want to be. You have to pray where God wants you to be. That's you and me. Because if we're not in divine order, if we're out of order, if we're out of sync, if we're not in the right place in the city, the state, if we're not helping the right missions, then we might be missing our blessings. And so we don't have to worry about Sam Ballard and Tobiah. We already are opposing enemy. We are our enemy because we feel traditionally and all that kind of stuff, we're supposed to do it a certain way. But where is the Holy Spirit in that? Okay, sure, you can speak in tongues. You can do all of that. But what is the tongues getting you? Please help me. Because some of us, we speak in tongues, but we ain't. We're not forging along. You know what I'm saying? And that's a message to take out. I look at a lot of people that want assistance. They want help. But I don't see them helping me. So I've gotten to a place where I'm not really there anymore. Because I understand how the world is created. And I understand how we help one another. We're a unit. You understand what I'm saying? Collective. And we're awakened to know that we're here to serve one another, not to be served. We're servants. All right? So any questions? Stockdale Paradox. That's what I just read. Any questions? I think I remember you sending that to us and us reading it. I think you can get uh, via email. I remember that. Uh huh. Yeah, I did. It was a really, really good read. Yeah. Yes, I did. And I, I kind of get where he said that um, the people who were optimistic, they didn't survive because they put a timeline on when they would get out, not knowing that. Instead of putting a timeline on it, why not put the work in and just give everything else to God. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah, and the book that um Jim Collins wrote is really good. It's um good to great. When good is not good enough. Um is what he um discusses with leadership. It's a book I had to read for school and it was really good because um he puts it in Um, context throughout the book how people are okay with good but really Jesus you know he said I wouldn't I wouldn't have you to live a mediocre life some people are satisfied with what they're doing but then they're not happy with the outcome and so when you're satisfied with good but you're not happy with the outcome that's an assessment you got to take you got to deal with that Because you and God are one. You know, it's up to us to make the change. It's up to us to even see that, um, like, you know, Stockdale here, he's saying your outcome is what you see. And this is true because when you go into um, Nehemiah, not Nehemiah, but Jeremiah, the first chapter, um, Jeremiah is is seeing what God is showing him. He's showing them that he can 
envision um, that he can receive as a prophet. You know, um, it all through the Bible it shows you where um, people are receiving um, visions, and so you have um, propaganda concerning. Um, um, seeing it and believing, but what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things to come. You understand? So that that means that we have to do some real thinking about how we see things in our mind, because where is your sight at, really? I mean, in most cases, until you bring people. Um, into a place of um, right here in this space, they get off the phone and they're back thinking about the rat race. Well, then if you get off the phone and you don't exercise what you're being given, that means that you will always see the rat race outside of you because that's all that you're thinking about. That's where your faith is. Your God is really the rat race you know, for those years, depression was my God until I learned that no one was going to do it for me. No one was going to encourage me. No one was going to believe because that was a gift that I needed to birth. So when you think about hardships that you're dealing with, you can see the pain turns into gain. Any questions? Hmm. No questions, but um, I definitely appreciate the input and you sharing your, you know, personal story about depression um, because I've definitely been there. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, when you said that, you know, if you're waiting for somebody to, basically somebody else to motivate you or you're waiting for it to happen, you're going to be waiting forever. I know that to be true as well. You know, because um, you've got to be your own motivating factor. You know, you really can't wait on anybody else, you know, to come come around and do it for you. So um, I definitely appreciated hearing that, as well as the, um, you know, the story of the, uh, you know, soldier that was a prisoner of war. Um, I I didn't think of it, you know, he, he definitely brings up an interesting perspective about the optimist and it almost sounds like um you know in the end um you know the the feelings of you know the the disappointment it was almost like um you know from a point of view of the of, of the pessimist you know what i mean it, it i right. guess there's just an irony there if you really like mm-hmm. look into it you know that um, they were let down, you know, it was it was from their disappointment that, you know, they ended up dying and, and you know, just kind of losing faith, you know, even though they had it in the beginning. And meanwhile, the pessimist, you know, didn't start off that way, like wasn't thinking, okay, yeah, we're going to be saved by Christmas, we're going to be saved by this, and they end up being the ones that, you know, persevere in the end. So it just, you know... Definitely um, food for thought. You know, my um, my grandfather had a similar story. He was a prisoner of war um, for about a year and a half, you know, with the same treatment and, and wow. things of that nature. Yeah. Um, but he handled it in a different way. Um, you know, he didn't handle it the same way this, you know, gentleman did. Like when he came back, there was a lot of coping with, um, you know, because back in those days they called PTSD shell shock. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have treatment and stuff like that that they do now. So he self-medicated with, you know, alcohol and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, ended up going that route Um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, died early from that. But um, it it was just it's interesting to see the different perspectives of, um, you know, prisoners of war and how they get through. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, I, I for myself, I thought it was um, um, like I don't know. It it really took me to another place when I read it. I had to read it again because it was his will that defined his faith to get him through that time 
of persecution. And um, we look at ourselves in the same positions as Christians. Um, And spiritually, we're going through things. You know, we look at Paul and a lot of um, the people that we read about, and we don't see this um, definition of um, a, a person and how they make make it out of there mentally because mentally it will destroy you or physically um, or it will break your heart like they said. So we have the Christians that are um, striving right now and um, they're trying to figure out what's happening when all they have to do is comply. You understand? So the complying part of it all, when God says to comply, it means simply to line up with what he's doing. Stop looking at what the world is saying concerning situations and look at what God's word is saying to you in a way that you've never seen it before because that's how he made it. So there's a philosophy that they bring into it that has to do with Hellenistic um, philosophy. It's called Stoicism. And a Stoic person is almost immovable. I mean, I know that I've had people to call me stoic. It means that you, you're very dry. You have no emotions in most cases, okay? So this is a philosophy. There was no emotion. So the optimist in most cases has what? Emotion? I'm optimistic. Um, I remember Shirley Temple singing, um, be optimistic, don't you be a grumpy. But, you know, However, it's working to get you through the situation because um, circumstances, even like here with Nehemiah, he began to pray and he turned his mind away from the distractions. People get up and they watch the news every day and then they wonder why they're depressed. All of that TV energy, all of that mess. Right. They're keeping up with the news. You understand? Sometimes you've got to guard your heart and mind in Christ is what it says. It says, lean not to your own understanding. Well, whose understanding are you going to have when you turn on the TV? That's right. It's going to be somebody else in the world. Because they're giving, yeah, they're giving you their perception. Right. Not to mention that the TV gives off energy. What energy is it? So stoicism, a philosophy. And that's what he went into as a professor. We don't know what his wife and him went through in the house concerning the issues, but there was some um, maintenance because he had been an admiral and mentally he had some kind of coping mechanism that got him through it. And he sim- he simply believed, okay. So, um, I will ask someone to pray as close if you guys have close. no. Okay. No I will pray as close. Um, but uh, really quick, I just wanted to um, say that I did post the definition in our little group chat that's on this um, line. The definition of comply that says to act in accordance with a wish or command. And then um, a second um, definition is of comply is to meet specified standards. So mm-hmm. just wanted to add that so in there. So what's God's standard for you? You know, and what's God's standard for us? And, you know, how how do we make it together as a unit and who belongs and who doesn't and what is your idea of um, collectiveness or unity, and how are you going to make it? Do you feel like in the next six months that you'll still be out there um, by yourself as an individual, or do you need that assistance to um, make it through the times that we're in? I mean, I think probably about six years ago, um, uh, eight years ago, I, I began to tell us on this study group that, People are saying things are going to get better, and it's a lie. The only thing that's going to get better is our cooperation and compliance with the will of God. 
What mm. is the will of God? Turning away from the world. Many churches have allowed the world into their churches, and the world has taken over their churches. You have to be different in order to get different results. This is what this guy is saying. Stockdale. Then you have Nehemiah also. He's looking at people that are trying to take away the purpose, you know. Hand me a brick. I don't want to hear what they have to say. He keeps on and he begins to pray. Instead of talking to the people about what they're saying and doing to you, turn away from that because guess what? It's immaturity. Why do I need to argue with you about what I'm doing? I know what I'm sent here to do. I don't need to deal with my monsters. I need to let God do it, and so I pray for you. The next thing is is mentally. If I'm mocked in my own mind, I need to pray for myself, strength that I can continue to journey, and then come together. That's why you have groups. You come together, small groups, big groups. You come together to assist one another, pillar, so that one another does not fall. And sometimes we need to deal with our minds concerning victimization. No one is a victim. You allow yourself to become a victim. Because if you're a victim, you would not be alive. Your purpose has a lot to do with what you've endured in your life. Use it. Use it. You begin to use the issues that you've dealt with in your life for the glory of God, you won't have time to speak to your mockers. They won't have time for you to look at them because you'll be busy about that initiative that you're working on. There's nothing, nothing. No one has done anything to you. God allowed it. Accept it. Now do something with it. Amen. Okay, Noah. God bless us. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for bringing us together this evening. Father God, we want to thank you for the word in a different different mindset, Father God. We want to thank you for um, a different view on how we see things, Father God. We want to thank you for our life and our daily bread, Father God. We want to thank you for our health. And the path that you have for us, the plans that you have for us, Father God, we know that it is to prosper us and not to harm us. Father God, I want to ask that you please help us to be more in tune with you. Please help us to um, consult with you before we make um, any decisions, Father God. Even if it's as simple as crossing the street, Father God, just help us to be um, really just in tune with you, Father God. We want to ask that you please just Watch over us, Father God. We thank you for being mm-hmm. our Father, our Comforter, our Provider. And, Father God, we just ask that you please keep our eyes open and our discernment on point, Father God, so that we are aware of our surroundings, the people around us, and the situations that we are walking in, Father God. Help us to see it for what it is and um, not through uh, our own lenses, Father God, where things are blurred. Help us to be able to see um the way that you want us to see things, Father God. Help us to be able to hear the things that you are trying to convey to us, Father God. Help us to really just be in tune to you and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I ask and pray. We ask and pray and we thank you, Father God. Amen. Amen. God bless you with healing. Uh, Honora and everybody else to see clearly. Amen and amen. Have a good night and a good week, guys. God bless you. Thank you, too. Good night. Yes. Thank okay.